To be honest, that is an interesting enough point in itself. But what does an even closer examination of some of these imperfections on the walls produce? There is a section of a great wall at Atlanta Tambo, Peru. Figure 66 has some highly unusual and very telltale markings on it. Notice the flat section near the top of the stone marked on the right and the long scrape marks on the stone marked on the left. These marks simply don't look as if they have been purposely carved onto the walls in any way at all. Another section of the Saxe wall figure 67 that bears a number of strange scrape marks and dents on its surface that look very much like tool marks. Interestingly, if you prod a lump of soft clay or cement with the end of a stick and let it dry, you can create marks and dents that look just like these. The stone work at Atlanta Tambo is nothing less than spectacular and not by using all our advanced laser and computer systems combined nor by gathering all the technology we could muster, could we begin to come even close to achieving what has been done in the construction of these jungle megaliths of ancient times. Softening the stones seems to be the only logical explanation of how these walls were built. It's the only thing that can adequately explain the precision fit of the stones which would then naturally settle snugly together under their own way, easily creating a perfect and gapless joint. This is a particularly enigmatic stone from the Atlanta Tambo wall figure 68. Although the surface of the stone is quite rough and could very well have been hewn, it is very difficult to explain the zigzagging pattern on the face of the stone. While it is true that the stairway pattern is a motif common to many Mayan structures, notice how the bottom section of the lower zigzag appears to have protruded slightly and sagged a little. It seems quite unlikely and somewhat unreasonable to think that something like this would have been purposely carved onto the surface of the wall. Other sections look as if they have been slapped with blocks or prodded with the end of sticks while the material was still soft and just look at the narrow filler stones between the large flags. On another section of the walls at Atlanta Tambo we can notice the small plugs protruding from the bottom of each small filling stone between the larger ones such as you might see used to provide stability in concrete form work. Figure 69 It is commonly believed that the protrusions found on the stones in these walls were used to hang gold plating or for tying ropes to fore handling. Unfortunately for both of these theories. The protrusions are of completely insufficient size or shape and are to randomly placed to be effective for either of those uses. They could however, be formed by making marks in the support structure. And interestingly, when working with a substance of such great weight, such protrusions would in fact, actually be necessary to prevent any uncontrolled movement of the heavy and wet material on the outer face of the wall while it's solidified. No one has adequately explained how the people of ancient times built these structures, or even why on earth they would have thought it necessary to go to so much trouble. All we know is that they did, because the structures are there and still defying our analysis. Archaeological and documented evidence suggests the actual builders of these incredible metallic fortresses may in fact date back to a period far before the Mayans inhabited the area too when the dominant race was the all next. There is also further evidence to suggest that the actual purpose of these structures may have been vastly more profound than simply temples or fortresses. This will be discussed further in a later chapter. It is obvious that the ancients actually did know of a way to soften stone. It seems to be the only thing that fits. How else could it have been done? Local legends repeatedly maintain that the walls were erected by giants, gods who raised the stones in a single night. Legends also tell of how the edges of the stones would be rubbed with the juice of a special plant which would soften the stone like clay and thus perfect the joint. To think that simply because we have not yet located the small crimson plant faucet spoke of in the myriad of unknown species that have yet to be discovered in the Amazon jungle certainly does not mean that such a plant does not exist. To rule something out completely because it has been found yet would be nothing short of foolhardy. With such an attitude we would never have discovered electricity. That's a given.
One of the more unfortunate things in the dilemma, though, is that time is fast running out. We may now never find any such plant. Not now that the main Amazon basin has been ruined by American oil interests and the remaining forests are still being destroyed at the rate of at least three football fields a day. It's almost like they're trying to make sure all evidence of such a thing is destroyed. But then, one should never attribute an action to malice when it can be adequately explained by stupidity. Though, when one is considering the actions, motives and attitudes of modern governments, unfortunately it's usually the former. Such a plant may have already become the victim of industry, lost forever in the technological crunch. But then, thanks to a remarkable man, we may not need to find it. Recent discoveries and work by a Dr. Joseph Davidovitz of the Geopolymer Institute have produced some remarkable insights into the processes the ancients may well have used to construct these amazing fortresses. Softening stone with plant extracts amazingly, the recent ethnological discovery has actually shown that some witch doctors of the HUANKA tradition remarkably use no tools in the making of small stone objects but in fact still use a chemical solution made from plant extracts to actually soften the stone material. According to Dr. Davidovitz, in a paper that was written by Dr. Davidovitz, a botnet and M. Merrill and presented at the 21st International Symposium for Archaeometry at Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York, USA in 1981. The starting stone material silicate or silico aluminate is dissolved by the organic extracts, and the viscous slurry is then poured into a mold where it hardens. This technique, when mastered, allows a sort of cement to be made by dissolving rocks. Statues which could have been made by the technique of the pre-Incan HUANKA, by dissolution followed by geopolymeric agglomeration, are found to contain Ca oxalate in the stone. The trio then proposed the hypothesis that the large stones in found in the Mayan fortresses and monuments were in reality, artificial and had in fact been agglomerated with a binder after certain rocks had been slowly disaggregated an idea that fits very well with what the walls look like, and also happens to be in total agreement with local legends and traditions such as those that were told to Fawcett. The group then even went on to present to the meeting some actual samples of stone that had dissolved and re-aggregated themselves to prove it. We present here the first results on plant extracts on the dissolution or disaggregation of calcium carbonate containing rocks biotooling action. The feasibility of chemically working calcium carbonate with various carboxylic acids found in plants acetic, oxalic and citric acid has been studied. Maximum biotooling action is obtained with a solution containing the vinegar 1m acetic acid oxalic acid 0.9m citric acid 0.78m The great surprise was actually to discover very ancient references to their use since Neolithic times for working materials which are very hard but easily attacked by acids such as chalk. Thus, the bas relief from the tomb of Mara, that S.A.Q.Q.A.R.A.H.V.I. dynasty, 3 millennium B. Egypt shows the hollowing out of Egyptian alabaster caco three bases by a liquid contained in a water skin or bladder. An experiment of interest was to compare the biotooling technique with the shaping of a hole using a steel tool and the quartz sand technique recommended by prehistorians. The hole resulting from sand abrasion has rough walls whereas biotooling gives a smooth finish. The work I drive. Davido Beats is nothing short of brilliant and also very refreshing. It's also interesting to know how quickly the problem was solved once the right approach to dealing with it had been adapted. There is now very little doubt about how the ancients actually built these incredible structures and indeed, softened or perhaps melting the stone has always really been the only possible explanation. The ancient Mayans were indeed quite capable of producing very large quantities of the acids that were used by Dr. Davidovitz in his experiments from many plants that were quite common to the region in the distant past. Plants such as fruits, potatoes, maize, rhubarb, rumex, agave americana, opuntia, ficus indica and garlic to name a few. It is highly feasible that the stones were quarried then broken or crushed to manageable sizes for transportation to the locations and re-aggregated on site while being cast back into the metallic slabs we now see, after all, since we have seen that they certainly had and knew about the means to do it, it somehow seems absurd to think they would not have made use of the knowledge. Once again, the simplest and most likely explanation is usually correct. But all of this knowledge still does not answer the fundamental questions. 
Who actually built them and why?